Thanks, Kelvin. Yeah. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay down the back there. Um, Kelvin, thanks very much for that introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here. James and I have done a few of these talks. Um, not this one, actually. We're trialling this one on you. It's new. Um, but we do do a bit together. So uh, the way it sort of works is that um, m my interest is Earth's past climate. So I'll talk a little bit about how warmer climates in the past inform us about the sort of um, future we might be heading into with global warming. And Kelvin's already mentioned global warming can happen just through natural causes. Um, clearly, at the moment, there's an additional factor, and that's us. So I'll, I'll start off by talking about um, how Earth's climate system works and how we know we have climate change. And I'm going to use a time machine to take us back to the future. My time machine is the geological record. It's geology, it's drill rigs, it's that sort of thing to unravel um, the history of our planet and how it has responded during um, warmer times. Now, James, of course, is well known to all of us. He's New Zealand's leading um, climate scientist. I like to embarrass him a little bit at these events. Um, he, he, yeah, I'm just getting warmed up. He, um, he will talk about what's happening at the moment, and then he'll talk about what we're in for and um, potentially uh, what we can do about it. It's not all doom and gloom, but some of it's a little bit concerning or, or very, very concerning. Um, so let's let's kick it off. I'm going to talk about the ice core record just to start with, and what you see there are bubbles of Earth's ancient atmosphere caught in bubbles and frozen in time, and we can go back almost a million years, um, and we can extract the gas out of these bubbles and we can reconstruct, it's a direct measurement, we can reconstruct what the atmosphere was like. We can measure the amount of carbon dioxide and the amount of methane in those bubbles. And, and, and those are the greenhouse gases, and James will talk more about them. But they're one of the major controllers of Earth's climate. So we can go back in time with these ice cores and look at how the greenhouse gases change through time, and perhaps how the climate change. So what, how did the temperature change, for example? So here's a record, and I do apologize for sh my second slide being a graph, but I think it's a pretty cool graph, and Al Gore used this graph um, with great dr drama um, in, his, in his first movie. And so what, what we're doing there is from the left to the right, we're going from 800,000 years ago to present day. And if you look at the top curve, you can see that there are fluctuations. The carbon dioxide concentration as measured from the bubbles in the ice cores goes up and down. It goes up from about 200 parts per million, uh, that's its lowest, and then it goes up to 300 parts per million and it bounces between. And if you look at the end of that graph, present day, in the last 100 years, it's, it's gone off the scale. It's gone to 400 parts per million. That's unprecedented in the last 800,000 years. And in fact, it's unprecedented in the last three million years. You have to go back three million years to the last time Earth had 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and our world was two to three degrees warmer. And I'll talk a little bit about what a two to three degree warmer world looked like um, from that geological evidence. Now, the graph below is temperature measured from the same ice core. Bit of clever geochemistry. We can tell from the composition of the ice, what the temperature was at the South Pole where this ice core was taken from. And what do you notice there? I could almost slide those two up and they completely overlay on each other. So when the, when the greenhouse gases have changed, naturally during natural climate cycles over the last million years, the Earth's surface temperature has responded exactly in step. There's a, the, the greenhouse gases and the temperature are totally coupled, as we like to say, in the climate system. So if you increase the greenhouse gases, you increase the Earth's temperature. If you decrease the greenhouse gases, you decrease the Earth's temperature. And you can see that during one of those cycles, it's about 10 degrees of global average temperature change. 
Uh, this is at the pole anyway. Not, it's not the average temperature, it's the polar temperature, James. I could see you looking at me. Um, okay, so if the Earth's been warming and cooling, what does that mean for the polar ice sheets? Surely they must be growing and shrinking. And if they're growing and shrinking, sea level must be going up and down. So let's look at what sea level does. And I'm going to, and we, we've reconstructed sea level. Um, it's very well established. And I'm going to overlay it on the temperature. It's going to be a black curve. Remarkable, isn't it? So then the planet warms, the planet cools, the ice sheets come, the ice sheets go, and sea level goes up and down by about 100 meters. So 20,000 years ago, you would have been able to walk 40 odd kilometers out to the west. It was all land. Sea level was 120 meters lower. So we don't debate the relationship between greenhouse gases and temperature and the Earth, Earth's climate anymore. And James will talk more on this and give you some more evidence for it. But the bottom line is, we know climate changes because of the past climate record. It tells us what the climate's capable of doing and it allows us to understand what is the natural variation we might expect and therefore is the trend in the last hundred years unusual and is it because of something natural or is it because of something we're doing on top of the natural variation. That's why the past climate record we think is very important. It allows us to understand what we're doing but it also gives us a clue if you push the system, if you put more carbon dioxide into it, what might happen? Okay, another graph. Um, so this is a sort of a bit of a complicated graph. And um, what it does is it, that's the ice core record there going back a million years. Then the scale keeps changing and I sort of apologize for that. But if you get right over to the left hand side, you're back half a billion years. So you've gone back in geological time 500 million years. The pink curve is carbon dioxide as we understand it from the geologic record. And I guess the point is that carbon dioxide has been a lot, lot higher in the past, right? It's been up. So currently we're at 400 parts per million. It's been as high as perhaps 4,000 parts per million in the past. And the world was a very different place. And I want to show you what the world was like. We'll actually go back to the Permian because it seems um, uh, relevant, to, particularly to this exhibition. But we'll also go back to two other times in the past that were warmer than today and, and look at what the world was like um, under conditions that we will expect in the future. So this is going forward. This is present day. This is two and a half thousand years into the future. And this is what the prediction is these are futures for our planet, depending on how much carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere. So if we achieve the Paris target of keeping global warming below two degrees, um, then we can't put more than 500 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We really have to reduce it to zero by the end of the century. So that's the challenge of Paris. If we burn it all, then we end up with a climate that we haven't seen for hundreds of millions of years. If we burn just a bit of it, we end up back in this territory over here. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples from the past of what the world looked like um, under some of these future scenarios. And the caveat, of course, is you've got to leave that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for a while before some of these things will happen. It won't happen overnight. It is starting to happen, but it will continue to happen for hundreds to thousands of years. So let's go back to the Permian. Um, in interesting time, um, it actually, w the end of the Permian, the Permian had ice ages, so it was actually, it was actually a bit, it wasn't as cool as it is today, but there were ice sheets on the planet, um, and the South Pole, or Antarctica, was pretty much over the South Pole as it is today, um, but there were forests in Antarctica, and these are images from Antarctic. You can see an old tree stump over there, petrified tree stump. There's the tree stump looking down on it. You can see the tree rings. So these are annual daily, these are daily, sorry, what am I saying? These are yearly tree rings. Um, 
but 250 million years ago. Quite amazing. Um, so this is from Antarctica. There were trees on Antarctica. There were... I've stopped. Let's see what that does. Okay. Ah, there we go. Um, and there were um, there were animals. There were um, the early the, the the predecessors of the or the ancestors of the dinosaurs, um, the predecessors of the dinosaurs, um, and it was just a very different place. And then it all of a sudden changed. And what this shows is the rate of extinction over the last 500 million years. And you can see uh, there are these five big extinctions where the extinction rate gets really high. As Kelvin said, the biggest one is the Permian-Triassic <coughs> boundary, the end of the Permian. And as he said, 90% of life on Earth got killed off um, at that time. So. The Permian was between 300 and 250 million years ago. It had ice, it had glaciers, it had trees, it had you know, all, quite a diverse bi um, life. And then all of a sudden it ended. And um, that just coincides with a huge spike in carbon dioxide, which you can see there at the end of the, and that, that terminates the Permian. Now, that's, that amount of carbon dioxide is the equivalent of using all the coal, oil, and gas, burning it all and putting it into the atmosphere. And we're well on our way um, to doing that. We're somewhere here in terms of, well, we're down here at 400 parts per million. Um, but back in the Permian, we probably had two to 4,000 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we think it was volcanic eruptions. We think it was the Siberian traps, big volcanoes in Siberia. But not only did they erupt, they went up through a lot of coal. And so they burnt all that coal as well and put a, put a, put a huge amount of carbon um, in the atmosphere. So we do have these periods in the past where, we, where we've played a natural experiment on the planet and we can go and ask the question, well, if you put 2 trillion, 3 trillion, 4 trillion tonnes of carbon in the atmosphere um, and we've put 500 billion tonnes already in the atmosphere, um, and we think we can put another 500 billion tonnes in, and that's it. That's less than that now, really, isn't it, James? It's probably more like 400 billion tonnes. So, but we can go and look at those times in the past and ask the question, what happened? So I'll move along. Um, now um, I'm 50 million years ago, and I'm in, in a time called the Eocene. Now, 50 million years ago, there was no ice on the planet. Temperatures were about 10 to 12 degrees warmer on average. There were crocodiles at the North Pole. And we know from the geological work we've done around Antarctica that if we look at the pollen and the spores, the trees that were growing down there were palms um, and this thing called Bombacace, Bombacaceae, which is a tropical tree with the big fat trunks that um, was growing down on, at latitude and, and the polar regions were perhaps uh, up to 20 degrees warmer. Okay, and then the planet cooled about 34 million years ago and the first ice sheets formed. So now I want to just talk briefly about those natural climate cycles I showed you in the very first slide. Uh, where we had the, the ice core showing the carbon dioxide and the temperature going up and down, they're very regular. They were happening every 100,000 years. And they're due to changes in the Earth's orbit. So the, the, these were discovered, these cycles, the so-called Milankovitch cycles, were discovered about 100 years ago by, by um, Milankovitch. And there was a predecessor who also... Um, discovered them, or added to that. Um, and, and, and what they realized is that Earth's orbit has changed systematically on long time periods, which has affected the amount of solar radiation hitting the surface of the Earth. So 
the axis of the Earth wobbles every 20,000 years. That's the precession cycle. The axis of the Earth also tilts every 40,000 years. So it's wobbling and tilting at the same time. A bit hard to get your head around. And the shape of the orbit goes from being circular to egg-like egg every 100,000 years ago. Those three variations, which are due to all the gravitational interactions in our solar system, that they, they can be predicted. They can be mathematically modelled with computers, and they're quite well known. And we can model them back 50 million years in time. We can model them forward 50 years in time, uh, 50 million years in time as well. So they're very well understood. They actually only lead to relatively small amounts of difference in the amount of incoming solar radiation, but it's enough to have very strong, powerful feedbacks um, in the climate system. So when we were able to do radiocarbon dating, which was a consequence of atomic energy um, in, in the sort of 50s, 60s, we started dating wood out of the deposits of the last ice age in the Northern Hemisphere. Turned out the last ice age was 20,000 years ago in the Northern Hemisphere and the, was, the continents were covered in ice. Antarctica was a little bit bigger. Um, and it just turned out that's exactly when Milankovic said the, the, these changes in Earth's orbit should have created a very cold climate. And um, so that was the proof of Milankovic's theory. We now have lots of other evidence that shows us that these cycles go way back through time, and there's the last five million years. And you can think of this curve as sea level, or you can think of it as temperature, 100 meter scale here, and going five million years into the future. This is the chap who very famously did a lot of this work. But all of these cycles relate to natural climate cycles driven by changes in the Earth's orbit. They're the Milankovitch cycles. Um, and I've got a blow up of the very last cycle that goes from 140,000 years ago, the world was as, well, 120,000 years ago, the world was as warm as it is today. Um, and then we went into this ice age. 20,000 20, years ago, sea level was 120 metres lower, and now we're back in a relatively warm period from a um, natural climate point of view. Now, the evidence for those sea level cycles is recorded locally. Um, in Wanganui and South Taranaki is a remarkable record. There's, a, it, there's, there's fossils and sedimentary evidence for every one of those, those changes in sea level that you could see on that curve. Um, so it really has become a world-class place to understand how global sea level has, has changed in the past. Um, you, these cycles are in the Rangitiki River, but they're also in the, in the coast um, as you come up from Wanganui um, all the way up to Patia. And uh, it was really first established 50 or 60 years ago by good old fashioned geology, describing the rocks, describing the changes in environment that the rocks represented but particularly using the fossils to understand how water depth had changed. So these are, this, these are old shorelines that were coming and going. And um, we take our students to these outcrops. We, we've, even take, we've taken all sorts of people to these outcrops. People come from all over the world to see them. Um, we've used them for training for the oil industry as well, even though there's no oil in these rocks. Um, and that's just a, a field trip very recently. The guy who gets the credit is Sir Charles Fleming, and he's a, he's a New Zealander, related to the Robert Oates Flemings. He was, I think, a gentleman geologist. I don't really think he needed a lot of funding. Um, but he, 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 he was interested in everything, geology, um, natural history, botany, um, zoology, the works. But anyway, he did this remarkable piece of work 60 years ago and he produced a sea level curve. And I don't need to go into the details except to say this is, you know, this is time going this way and this is sea level going up and down. And he realised from the fossils in Wanganui and the, and the sediments in Wanganui that there'd been a lot of action. Sea level had gone up and down, the shoreline had gone backwards and forwards um, over the last several million years. But he couldn't explain it. 
because back in the day, the traditional thinking from the Northern Hemisphere was we had only had four ice ages. Um, and so he had these like 20, 30 cycles and he's sort of going, well, how does this work? Sea level's gone up and down. So he put it down to some sort of vertical land movement, some sort of tectonics, that sort of thing. But he, he lived through the 70s. I think he died in the 80s. And he saw the first sea level curves come, come out, like the one I showed you. And the penny dropped. And he realized that he had a remarkable record that others like myself ended up doing our PhD, my PhD on um, to, to sort of tie in with those global sea level changes. So now I'm going to go to this period three million years ago, and I'll have to, um, I'll be wrapping up. Um, I'll have to give James a chance in a minute. Um, and I just want to talk about what the world was like the last time we had 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And particularly, what did that mean for the, for the polar ice sheets? So um, one of the things I'm very interested in, and people at Victoria are very interested in with our colleagues overseas, is getting geologic records from around the Antarctic ice sheet, which, hold, which can show us what happened in the past. We can reconstruct how the ice sheet changed, how the ocean temperature changed, how the, the land temperature changed. Um, so the world on average was two to three degrees warmer. But we know the ocean temperatures around in the Ross Sea, for example, were four to five degrees warmer. Now, when you have four to five degree warmer temperatures in the Ross Sea, you can't have ice. Ice just doesn't like water that, that is that hot. And on the bottom of the bottom here is sort of the situation we reconstructed. Um, no Ross ice shelf. This is the floating Ross ice shelf, which we put our drill rig on, drilled down into these sediments underneath. So the Ross ice shelf was gone. Um, this is the present day. Of course, there were times in the past, like the last ice age, where the ice sheet was much bigger. But if we go back three to four million years, there really was no um, Ross ice shelf. There was no West Antarctic ice sheet. And we now know from some computer modeling that fits our geologic data that perhaps we lost 12 to 13 meters out of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And with Greenland, sea level was 20 meters higher. So the take home message from this sort of research is if you leave the present concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you will end up with sea level that's 20 meters higher. A world that's two to three degrees warmer and sea level that's 20 meters higher. The concern, as James will show you, is if we don't do anything about this, we'll end up in a world that's four to five degrees warmer by the end of the century with consequences for even higher sea levels. Now, I'll just finish up with a um, final comment about how fast sea level can rise. So uh, two to three degrees of global warming, keep it there. You can end up with tens of meters sea level rise, but how fast? So this is a curve showing the sea level rise since the last ice age as those big ice sheets melted on the northern hemisphere and sea level rose 130 odd meters to present day. So this is time, this is shallow, this is the sea level rising. And you can see we hit our present level about six, 7,000 years ago. So sea level's been pretty stable. Our climate and sea level's been pretty stable for the last five or 6,000 years. Good thing for us, our, our civilization has flourished. We had to, haven't really had to mess with climate change, not until very recently. But just to show you what the system's capable of, about 14,000 years ago, when those big ice sheets were melting off the northern hemisphere, it gets really steep, this curve. Sea level was rising at three meters per century. Today, sea level is rising at 0.3 meters per century. It's predicted to rise, be as rising as fast as perhaps um, 1.5 meters per century by the, by the, by the end of the century. Um, we're certainly going to get sea level rise from what we've done already, the heat that's already in the system. The question, the question is how much. So I guess the point is the sea level rise we've seen so far from global warming is really um, only a small part of what the system's capable. And going from an ice age into a 
uh, warm period as we have over the last 20,000 years, um, the average rate of sea level rise is a metre per century. So we've only got a third of that right now. And we're, the big question, and James will touch on this, the big question is um, what are we going to get um, and how certain are we about that? So I've done the easy stuff. Um, I've talked about the past. And James is now going to talk about implications for the future. Thank you. Okay, so I'm James and he was Tim. He still is actually. Um, so Tim does himself a great disservice saying I've done the easy part. I mean I think the science behind understanding all of this and how to get information out of fossils and sediments and ice cores to understand how the climate's varied in the past is one of the great scientific achievements of the last century. It's really amazing stuff. But yeah, thinking about how what this all means for the future is, is another story. So we'll go back to what's going on with carbon dioxide concentrations. This is yet another uh, graph, another way of showing the recent information. So what I've got here, I haven't gone right back to the last million years or more. It's, it's only the last 13,000 years or so. So since we came out of the last ice age, basically. So we've got carbon dioxide concentration on the vertical scale here, uh, starting at around somewhere between 260 and 280 parts per million. That's the, the pre-industrial concentration. And the green and the red are from two ice cores in Antarctica. And Tim's explained how we get this information out of the, the air bubbles and the ice cores. And then the blue line is the direct measurements in the atmosphere taken in Hawaii, the Mauna Loa Observatory. And you can see where they overlap, they all line up very nicely. And you can also see on the scale of, you know, the Earth operates on quite long time scales. If you're thinking geological, you know, it's millions of years. Uh, but even the circulation of the deep ocean and the, the melting and the freezing of these ice sheets, we're talking thousands of years or maybe even 10,000 years. So the Earth thinks about all of this uh, on this sort of time scale. So the, the, the increase in carbon dioxide in the last 100 years or 200 years or so since the Industrial Revolution is almost instantaneous as far as the, the Earth is concerned. So as Tim was alluding to, we've really only started to see what will happen to the climate system. Uh, if we don't stop this rise, then we may see rather more change in the climate than we would like to see. So uh, as Tim was saying, um, the last time we had carbon dioxide concentrations this high in the atmosphere was something like three million years ago um, during the mid-Pliocene. And the reason, you know, I talk about, we all talk about carbon dioxide a lot. So, you know, so what? Why carbon dioxide? There's other greenhouse gases, there's methane, even water vapour, the stuff that produces the thunderstorms that we saw last night. That, that's a greenhouse gas too. The reason carbon dioxide is so important is that it stays in the atmosphere so long. You put this stuff in and it'll be there, most of it'll be there for a thousand years, some of it'll be there for 10,000 years. Water vapour, as you experience on a daily basis, falls out of the sky very quickly, a matter of days. Uh, methane, it might be a couple of decades, nitrous oxide is up to a century, but nothing beats carbon dioxide. So in the long run, how much of this stuff is in the air is what's most important. And the rise in carbon dioxide, we know um, that sort of thing has happened in the past, as Tim was showing. But we can look at the chemistry of the carbon, the isotopic signature of the carbon, and can tell that this increase uh, in the last 100 years or so has to be fossil carbon. It's got to be carbon that's been stored away from basically sunlight, cosmic rays, uh, for a very long time. So there are no radioactive isotopes of carbon in this carbon dioxide. So we know it's got to come from somewhere under the ground that's been underground for a very long time. So that points to things like oil and coal. And as the carbon dioxide's been going up in the atmosphere, the amount of oxygen's been going down. So that's a sure sign of burning. So the story is that this rise in carbon dioxide has to be from burning something that's been fossilised. So it's very much the only candidate really is the burning of oil, coal and gas of fossil fuels. So we know very clearly that we're responsible for this, um, this change in the atmosphere that's um, unprecedented in several million years. And Tim also mentioned 
the Milankovitch cycles, the slow changes in the orbit of the Earth and so on, that change the amount of sunlight that falls at different latitudes, uh, different times of year. And that's what causes the ice sheets to grow and, and decay and so on. And it's really only those two things, the amount of sunlight falling on the Earth and the amount of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Those are the only things we've really got to play with to change the climate. And naturally, they tend to work together over these ice age cycles. But right now, sunlight isn't changing to speak of, uh, but the carbon dioxide concentrations certainly are. And as this stuff goes up, we are seeing warming, that's for sure. So um, you may be familiar with this story, yet another graph. Um, this is average temperatures over the surface of the Earth for the last 140 odd years, since 1880, uh, up to the last bar of last year, 2017. So the zero line here is uh, our best estimate of what the pre-industrial temperature was. Uh, really, we don't have good estimates of the global temperature before about 1880 or maybe a little bit before that. So the, the temperature in the late 19th century is taken as our best guess at the pre-industrial. So that's where I've set the zero. So you can see, you know, that there's plenty of ups and downs. There's El Nino events, there's volcanic eruptions, you name it. But there's an obvious upward trend. And the last three years, 2015, 16, 17, are the three that have been all above one degree above pre-industrial. So the Paris Agreement uh, that was signed uh, a couple of years ago talks about keeping global warming well below two degrees above pre-industrial and aiming to keep it to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, very good idea, I would say. Uh, but you can see we're already above one degree. In fact, 2016, with the help of El Nino, I was above 1.2. So we're starting to get up towards that one and a half degree limit at least. Two degrees is still a wee way away, but, um, but we're getting there. So that's what's happened in the atmosphere, in the air, over the surface of the Earth over the last hundred or so years. But it's just a tiny part of the story, actually, because about 70%, nearly three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered in water, in oceans, and water is really, really good at absorbing heat. Most of the heating so far has gone into the oceans. So here's a, a schematic of what that's all about. Again, it's time from this, only from 1970 when the uh, reliable records really began through to 2015. And it's estimated that about 93% of the heating has actually gone into the oceans rather than, than the atmosphere. This bit here is the warming of the air and then you've got land surface warming and the melting of ice, the very bottom bit there. This is really good news for us, because if all of the heating had gone into warming the air so far, temperatures would already have gone up over 50 degrees, we'd all be dead and I wouldn't be talking to you. So it's fantastic this is happening, but the only catch is all this humongous amount of heat that's going into the, um, into the oceans ultimately has consequences for things like the Antarctic ice sheets because it's the warmer water around the edges of Antarctica that start to nibble away and, and melt some of this ice. So it takes the ocean a long time to adjust to this kind of thing, but um, ultimately it may, we may pay the price in terms of the sorts of sea level rise that Tim was talking about just before. Anyway, warming the oceans, like anything, the, the atmosphere has got deeper because it's warmer and the oceans have got deeper because they're warmer. Anything you warm tends to expand. So we have had sea level rise. You heard that we've had stable sea levels for several thousand years, but starting mm, somewhere between two and 300 years ago, sea levels started to go up again. So here's a, a curve of sea level change, global average from 1880 again to uh, just a year or two ago. And the vertical scale here, the zero point now is the sea level in 1880. And the vertical scale is in millimetres. So uh, you're hearing that you know, the rate of rise at the moment is only about three, uh, 30 centimetres per century, 300 uh, millimetres. And in the period since 1880, we've had getting on for 250 millimetres, um, nearly 25 centimetres, about that much sea level rise. Uh, the, this curve is not a straight line. Back, back here was about one millimetre per year, and the middle here is about two millimetres per year, and we're up over three millimetres per year at the moment. So that rate of rise is increasing as ice especially starts to melt. That's the other component that 
ice is melting and that water is flowing into the ocean off the land. Okay, so that's where we're at. And the real question, and I guess what everyone's really concerned with, is where are we going to go? Where, where to from here? So the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report talked about this at great length, of course. And this, this one graphic sort of summarises what the future might hold. So this is again time along the bottom from 1950 to the end of this century. And the vertical scale is change in temperature globally in degrees C. So the black part here the, to the left of this vertical line is the past and since 1950 and the zero point is the temperature basically at the end of the 20th century. We had a, a half a degree or a bit more warming in that period. And then these two coloured lines to the right show possible futures. The blue line is something like living up to the Paris Agreement. So we'd had nearly a degree of warming globally at the end of last century, and we're getting another degree roughly by the end of this century. So something close to two degrees of global warming, with a certain amount of you know, uncertainty here. And so if we limit emissions dramatically over the next couple of decades, then we might get onto this blue path. At the moment, for the last couple of decades at least, we've been more on the red path, which is the sort of keep burning all the oil and coal future. And that's where, as Tim was mentioning, you know, we might have up to another, another four degrees of warming just this century, even though we've already had one degree. So it could be five degrees above pre-industrial by the end of this century. And you can see this red line is still going up pretty steadily. And if we just left it, we'd go right back to the sort of Eocene climate, you know, 10 degrees warmer, crocodiles at the North Pole, all that kind of thing. And sea levels would be something like 80 metres higher than present. So I would say we definitely want to avoid <coughs> carrying on on that route. I'll talk about what we have to do to get onto this path um, in a little bit. So I think, you know, what this tells me is we've already put a lot of this stuff in the air. We've already changed the climate quite a bit. But what we do in the future, what we do from here, you know, we have a lot of power over the future. This, this future would be very different to this one. And if we choose to limit emissions of greenhouse gases, get onto renewables, all that kind of thing, quickly, we can have a, a huge amount of influence on what the future looks like. So, you know, this, this gives me some hope. There is still time to do something here. But one degree of warming so far, maybe one more degree of warming, it doesn't sound like much. And I think a way to think about it is to think about extremes and, and the kind of climate that we're used to. So what I've got here is that record of global temperatures over the last 120 odd years from 1880 to the present, but I've compressed it into the first half of the graph. We've had about a degree of warming so far. What if we got another degree of warming in the next 100 years? So what if we lived up to that sort of upper end of the Paris Agreement? What, what would this graph look like? Well, it could look something like this. So if I came back in 2118 and gave this same talk again, you might see a graphic that looks a bit like this. This is not my forecast. It's not, you wouldn't want to look too closely at each year. But what I've done is take the sorts of ups and downs we've seen in the past, gradually add another degree of warming over the next 100 years, and just put the, the variations on top. And, and that's what I got. And it's probably you know, not unreasonable. Uh, the year-by-year -year variations I wouldn't bank on, but the sort of trend is fair enough, I'd say. So we're getting a little bit above two degrees some years up here, but we're also down below two degrees some other years. So, okay, but think about where we're at at the moment. This black line is 2016. It's the warmest year on record so far, about 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial. And you can see if this was right, then we'd have a bunch of years in the 2030s that would be cooler than that warmest year on record. But then after that, after about 2040, every year would be warmer than what we presently call the warmest year on record. And that's just with a few tenths of a degree more warming over the next 20 or 30 years. So this would be a climate that's completely unknown to humanity, basically. And if we allowed the warming to get to four or five degrees, well, you can imagine it would be pretty hard to deal with. So even with that level of warming, some quite dramatic things can happen. Um, this piece of work came out of CSIRO in Australia last year that got a lot of press over there for obvious reasons. So scientists in Australia are saying that cities like Melbourne and Sydney 
would expect to have days over 50 degrees C before the end of the century with this kind of warming that we're talking about. So the sorts of extremes that we just haven't experienced before would become more commonplace, or would certainly be observed. And New Zealand would be the same. I'm not saying it'll be 50 degrees in New Plymouth anytime soon, um, but getting high temperatures that are outside our experience, getting extreme rainfalls that are outside our experience is the sort of thing we can expect through the rest of the century, even if we do get on top of emissions quite quickly. So for New Zealand, if we had a, you know, a two degree overall warming would go with, you know, and these are very round numbers, but something like a tripling of the number of hot days where you are. And what you call a hot day depends on where you are, I think, a bit. For a lot of New Zealand, 25 degrees is a pretty warm day, maybe 30 degrees. It doesn't really matter where you set the threshold, you get the same sort of increase, about three times as many days in the future, with that much average warming. And one of the features of climate change is that the places that are already dry tend to become drier as time goes on, and the places that are already wet tend to become wetter. So the, the drier parts of the country, which are more the eastern part of New Zealand rather than the, the western coast where we are now, would become on the order of 5 to 10 per cent drier than they are at present or were, say, 50 years ago. So that would go with a tripling, roughly, of the, the number of droughts. So instead of a, dr uh, a severe drought once every 20 years, you might see one once every six or seven years, something like that. And that, that drying in the east and the warming goes along with a massive increase in the risk of forest fires. So the Forest Research Institute, Scion, and the, the Rural Fire Authority have looked at this in great detail. And they estimate that the whole of the eastern part of New Zealand, all the way from uh, eastern Southland right through to East Cape in the North Island, would experience nearly half the year, four to six months of the year, in either very high or extreme fire danger. There are one or two little spots in, in, around Gisborne and one in Canterbury where you could say that already. But basically everywhere from Balclutha to north of Gisborne would be like that every year. It doesn't mean there would be lots more fires like the one on the Fort Hills last year uh, near Christchurch, but the risk would certainly be there. And the big glaciers in the Southern Alps, um, the expectation from our models of these, these glaciers, like the Franz Josef, are that the, the recession and the downwasting, the, the lowering of the altitude at the top of the ice there, uh, the thinning, basically, would just continue, would increase and the ice would recede up the valley, and so by the end of the century, the terminus of the glacier would be up here somewhere. So that wouldn't be so brilliant for the tourist industry, at least, and it would, you know, it would really change our perception, I think, of what New Zealand is when you see these big pieces of ice disappearing. And it would also change the seasonal cycle of the availability of water in the rivers, you know, the melt of ice and the seasonal snow would also be decreasing, so it would have big implications for water storage, water availability, especially in the South Island, but also the mountains in the North Island. So I talked about uh, drought becoming more frequent, but the perverse thing about climate change with rainfall is that not only do you see an increase in the intensity and the frequency of droughts, but you see an increase in the intensity of floods as well, like this big flood that affected Edgecombe um, uh, just over a year ago. So these really intense rainfall events we would expect to see also happening somewhere between twice and three times as many uh, as often by the end of the century. And what's going on there is that uh, the amount of moisture in the air is purely related to temperature. Warmer air can contain more moisture. So when there's a rainfall event, the ra there's more rain to fall out. So you are more likely to get this kind of scenario happening. But on the other side, when you get a big anticyclone and it's very sunny and it's warmer than it is now, evaporation works better, so moisture gets sucked out of the soil faster. So perversely, it's easier to have a drought as well as it's easier to have a flood. So the, the story that came out of the last report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was this little motto, the wet get wetter and the dry get drier. And what they meant was... The monsoon regions of the world, the monsoons get heavier, and the desert regions of the world, 
uh, become even drier and, and wider than they are at the moment. But it also applies to wet seasons, dry seasons, even wet weather events and dry weather events. So that's how come you can have a, a, a more intense drought at the same time, the risk of a big flood goes up. And to get back to the sea level rise story that Tim was talking about, um, so we've had this 25 odd centimetres of sea level rise in the last 150 years or so. Um, as sea levels continue to rise, and there's quite a bit of sea level rise just already baked into the system, it's going to take the oceans at least a century to adjust to what we've done already. So we're probably going to get at least another half a metre of sea level rise. As that continues, we're going to see more of this kind of thing. So this is a road in South Canterbury in the South Island uh, two or three years ago now. There was a storm, big waves came further onshore than normal, uh, the, the normal sort of high tide marks down here somewhere. And these, these bluffs that the road was built on, are, I don't know exactly, but at least five or six metres high. So this road was several metres above sea level. So being X number of metres above sea level, more than the, the rise in sea level, doesn't necessarily protect you. It's, it's how close to the high tide mark you are. The beach is going to stay relatively flat as the tide rises. So the water's going to come inland quite a way. If you raise sea levels one metre, the high tide mark might come inland 50 metres. And if there's anything in the way, well, it'll get eaten away. So um, if you've got your house on a sand dune right in front of the beach, the height of the sand dune is no guarantee that your um, property is going to be OK, unfortunately. Now, last summer was a pretty extreme summer. It was the warmest summer on record, and we had two or three ex-tropical cyclones pass through the country. This is a photograph taken just outside Nelson uh, with one of those cyclones, Cyclone Fahey, uh, that passed over the country, I think, in February. And this is the storm surge onto a, a road. You can just see a little bit of the road, and this is a, a telling sign. Yes, the road is, in fact, giving way. And as the sea level rises, it becomes easier and easier for these storm events to affect whatever is in the way of the waves. All right, so if we get, we've had about 25 centimetres of sea level rise in the last 150 years. Another 30 centimetres is pretty much guaranteed, whatever we do next. And it won't take 150 years, it'll take about 30 or 40 years. So that's that increase in rate of sea level rise. And if you raise sea levels are about 30 centimetres, then the, what we call a 1 in 100 year coastal flooding event, coastal inundation event, starts to happen roughly annually. This, this, these are round numbers, doesn't apply everywhere, but it's a, it's a good rule of thumb. So we're, we're guaranteed to get that. If we carry on putting plenty of carbon dioxide in the air, then the 1 in 100 year event would become roughly, well, it would become the average in a lot of places, essentially. So one metre of sea level rise would push the shoreline inshore enough to give us the one in a hundred year event becoming the average condition, really, the daily event. And this is sort of business as usual for the end of the century. And this is the sort of good end of the business as usual story. So uh, Tim was talking about the, oh, sorry, yeah. So the issue here is a lot of us live, live near the coast. And that's because sea levels haven't risen for thousands of years. We've got very used to the fact that we can live right by the coast and the tide goes up and down and there is a storm occasionally, but the ocean doesn't come towards us. That hasn't happened for nearly 10,000 years. All of civilised society is built up in that time. So all these big cities, Shanghai, New York, London, New Plymouth, Wellington, Auckland, Christchurch, big problems. The coast is coming inland and we're going to have to deal with that. How far it comes inland, I think, ultimately is going to depend on Antarctica. So Tim was talking about these times in the past where the Ross Ice Shelf disappeared and sea levels were X number of metres higher than present. And uh, some of my colleagues, or more Tim's colleagues at Victoria, have done some really nice modelling of the ice sheets. And uh, colleagues in the US, which uh, th this paper comes from... Uh, work done in the US recently, similar story to what we find here with our work. And what we're showing here is the contribution to global sea level just from Antarctica, um, depending on what we do with global emissions or how much warming we allow. 
So uh, this is over 500 years, so you know it takes a long time to melt some of these big pieces of ice. But once you start the melting, you cannot stop the melting, so you lock something in. Sometime in the next 50 or 60 years or so. So if we do the, the most strenuous version of the Paris Agreement and keep warming to about 1.5 degrees, nothing much happens in Antarctica. So the vertical scale here is the contribution to global sea levels just from Antarctica in metres. If we let the warming get much above 2 degrees, then the West Antarctic ice sheet starts to go sometime later this century, and you can't stop that happening. So we get 5 metres, maybe more, over the next few hundred years. If we press on with putting more stuff in the atmosphere, more carbon emissions, then at about the same time, we'd have to wait a few decades yet, you get on a much steeper trajectory and we might have 10, 12, 13 metres of sea level rise over the next few hundred years. And that line keeps going up and ultimately we could lose all the ice and it would be 70 or 80 metres. The problem with all of this, beyond just these numbers, is that once you get past this point here, and exactly where it is is still a very much a matter for discussion, you can't stop the melting once it's started. So if we allow global warming to get much above two degrees, and exactly what I mean by much above two degrees is still, again, a research topic, but uh, basically the harder we push the system, the, the more likely we're going to get onto one of these paths here. So this is a really good argument for keeping the warming well below two, two degrees, preferably down at one and a half degrees. Right, I'm running out of time. Um, I'll just flash through a couple of things that I would urge you to read this if you haven't read it. Uh, there was an article published in this magazine called the New York Magazine just under a year ago now. Um, and if you just Google uninhabitable earth, you'll find it. That caused a storm of protest when it came out because it's quite a gloomy story. But what the, what the journalist who wrote it was saying was that he, he just took what's published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and so on, but the sort of upper end of the scenarios, you know, what could happen, what's the, what's the high end of the uncertainty, and worked out what might happen around the world. Uh, there was so much protest for this article that he wrote an annotated version and put that online, and that's got all sorts of links to scientific papers and discussions with scientists, so you can read all the background to this. And I found this really interesting. I wasn't I didn't think it was a bad thing to do. A lot of people say you shouldn't ever say things that are frightening. You want to talk about opportunities and encourage people to take action that's positive. And, you know, that's, that is fair enough. But what this person was saying was that really a lot of members of the public don't understand the scale of the risk that we're talking about here and that you have to know what's at stake before you really feel motivated to take action. So his argument was that... Um, complacency was a much bigger problem than, than fatalism, than people just sort of switching off because it all seems too hard. So he was saying more, many more people are not scared enough than are already too scared. And I'm not deliberately trying to scare people, but I couldn't agree more with this. You know, I don't know that a lot of politicians understand what could happen and what the timescales of all of these hap things happening are. So, you know, so what could happen? This is a map of how quickly temperatures will go off the scale. The darker the colour, the quicker that happens. So this purpley region in the tropics, we're talking sort of 2040, 2050, you're already outside the known climate. Droughts and heat waves could lead to crop failures, food shortages, potentially famines in some parts of the world, especially in the tropics. Very heavy rainfall events can lead to things like this. This is a photograph taken in Bangladesh last year. Nearly half the country was underwater at one time. Huge damage to infrastructure, you know, loss of life, damage to food production again, all sorts of things. So you can definitely have too much water as well as too little water. And ultimately, if you're in a place that's already a bit politically risky and there's a bit of conflict already, then putting a bit of drought on top of it is not going to be a good idea. This is a, a burning tank in Syria, and the Syrian civil war, one of the contributors to that was a very extreme drought that happened for about three years before the fighting really got underway. And it's well known that that drought had quite a climate change fingerprint to it. 
So I'm not saying this is going to happen here anytime soon, but I've been at a couple of meetings recently in Wellington where you know the New Zealand Defence Force is really starting to think about this and what the implications are for the Pacific if people start to lose their homes and their livelihoods. All sorts of things can happen. Okay, so what do we do about this? How do we stop the warming? Well, we've got to stop that rise in carbon dioxide concentrations. That's, that's the only way to go. So we need to get onto this blue path, or preferably, actually, get below it. Tim mentioned the sorts of numbers we're talking about, you know, trillions of tonnes of carbon dioxide that go into the atmosphere. We do have a big budget of carbon dioxide for a certain amount of warming. For two degrees of warming, three trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide can be put into the atmosphere. The catch is we've already put well over two trillion tonnes into the air, and at present rates of release of this stuff into the air, we don't actually have much time uh, to deal with it. So if we want to stop the warming at two degrees, then we've got something like 15 to 20 years left at the present rate of emission of greenhouse gases around the world. If we just carry on for another couple of decades, we will guarantee two degrees of warming. That's what that's saying. And if you want to do one and a half degrees, we're talking something like five, six, seven, maybe up to 10 years from now at the present rate of warming, uh, present rate of emission of greenhouse gases. So to start pushing that time frame out, we need to do things urgently. Planting a lot of trees, that will suck up a bit of carbon dioxide by us a bit of time. Cutting down on um, fossil fuels for transport, electric vehicles, all of those kinds of things can reduce the emissions globally if it's done globally and start to buy us time and give us time to hopefully keep us below that blue line. But it is, you know, it's an urgent problem. The effects in terms of the ice sheets might take hundreds of years, but what we do in the next 10 years will determine the fate of some of those things. Okay, so there have been huge changes in the climate in the past, uh, and that's all down to how the sun falls on the earth and how bright the sun is, plus how the carbon dioxide and other gases have varied. And the climate change today is really all about the variation, the rise in greenhouse gases. How much warming we get this century? Well, that's up to us. If we get another degree, half a degree, three degrees, four degrees, totally depends on what we do with global emissions. We know that even for one more degree of warming, the rate of extremes and the, the intensity of some of these extremes is going to increase quite a bit. And there's a certain amount of change that's already locked in, sea level rise certainly, and a, and a bit more warming is already in the system. And yeah, I mean, I don't think I need to spell this out. The risks around water availability, damage to infrastructure, food production, food shortages, you know, uh, could be astronomical, basically. And as a, as a society, as a civilization, we are just not used to this kind of thing. The climate and sea levels just have not really changed much, apart from a few blips in a few parts of the world. There's been no environmental change, really, for thousands of years. And we've got used to that, and we're not used to thinking about this kind of thing. So this idea that the past, what we've known for the last few hundred years, not being a guide to what the future is going to be like is really important for us to, to embrace, basically. I haven't really talked about this too much, but you know, New Zealand is a very connected country. We export a lot of stuff around the world. We have a lot of tourists coming here. We travel overseas a lot. What happens in other countries will really affect us greatly. You know, if someone else's economy is damaged because of some climate catastrophe, that's going to affect us because we probably won't be able to trade with that country so well and so on. So we need to think about what's happening uh, overseas. And, you know, the Pacific Island countries, which we have some obligation to in a lot of cases, some of those low-lying atolls are starting to disappear already and people are going to want to come here. We have to, we have to deal with that. And the time frames for all this are pretty fierce. Two degrees of warming could be locked in with a, within 20 years. We've already had quite a bit of change, and changes are underway as we speak, but we still do have time to respond if we get on with reducing emissions. And I think the, the, um, the new government we have in New Zealand are at least talking the right sort of talk, whether we see things actually happening, 
in New Zealand and whether we can act them as, as an example to the other countries of the world, we'll wait and see. But um, if we act quickly, we can actually avoid a lot of these bad scenarios for the future. Okay, so I've gone way over time, but, um, but that's my lot. Thanks very much and happy to take any questions. So, so the question was, you know, electric cars all very well. What about eating, what, what we eat? And I, I guess the illusion there is to a vegetarian diet rather than a meat-eating diet. And yes, it is, I haven't done the research myself, but it's well known that um, going to a vegetarian diet saves a lot of emissions because to grow the, the animal that you will subsequently eat takes a lot more um, resources and energy and produces a lot more emissions than you know, growing a grain crop, basically. So yes, that's one of, the, one of the things that we can do. I'll have to say I am not vegetarian. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. I eat a lot less meat than I used to, but I haven't quite given up the occasional mince pie. But um, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, uh, I've always, following on from that question, I've always had a bit of concern about the, um, about the agricultural contribution to carbon emissions. Now, I understand that we're told that there's about 47% 40, of New Zealand's carbon emissions are agricultural. Is that right. your understanding? Yep, something like that. Yeah. Now, do, can you tell me, does that 47% take into account the carbon absorbed by the grass they eat, or is it just a gross emission figure? No, it does take account of it. It's the whole life cycle thing, and, and that, that contribution to New Zealand's emissions, it's, it's, well, we could get into the details, but basically, what ruminant animals, you know, cows and sheep produce is methane, which is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. It doesn't stay in the atmosphere so long, it's only 20 years or so, but while it's there, it has a much greater warming effect. So that's, that's the calculation that's done. And it's been the intensification of dairying, basically, in the last few decades that's grown the amount of that methane that, that New Zealand puts into the atmosphere. So is, is, is methane um, increasing in the atmosphere at a greater rate than CO2? That's a really interesting question. So, sorry, and the question was, is, is the methane increasing in the atmosphere at a greater rate than carbon dioxide? Um, it's been a really interesting story with methane. It was growing rapidly through the second half of the 20th century, and then just after the turn of the century, it flattened off stopped rising and nobody knew why. Some people said, oh, it's the collapse of the Russian economy and they're not producing so much gas and all this kind of thing, but we don't really know. And scientists was, who study this stuff were scratching their heads and um, then all of a sudden it started rising again about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago and, and methane levels are rising quite rapidly now. Whether it's faster than the carbon dioxide concentrations, I'm not entirely sure, but it has become, it's quite rapid, you know, in a historical sense at the moment. So exactly what's going on with methane and what the contribution is from, from wetlands, from things like rice farming, from ruminant animals, agriculture, uh, and, and from what they call fugitive emissions, you know, extracting gas out of the ground, some of the, some of the gas escapes basically. So some of the methane rise in methane is likely to be coming from that. But yeah, if, if methane levels rose rapidly over the next, say, 20, 30 years, that could accelerate the warming in the short term, which could have consequences for things like ice melt and all that. So it is a, it is a worry, certainly. Yes? Um, obviously, we can all do things as individuals, but surely the biggest pressure has become politically um, yep. what you, what's your feeling, you know, with the various meetings and things, that you will get the kind of political action that you desperately need? Right. Uh, so, will we get the polit political action we need? Not just New Zealand. Yeah, internationally. Yeah. You know, New, New Zealand. Yeah, so what what is the political action going to be? Wow. <laughs> Great question. So, the, the Paris Agreement, which was signed, which was sort of hammered out at the end of 2015 and signed in 2016, 
is a great achievement from a you know diplomatic point of view. It's the first time, virtually, that the world's countries have come together and agreed to something like that. But it's just a piece of paper, right? You know, <laughs> the actual actions have to follow, and the the cuts and emissions that the individual countries take on have to be big enough to you know get the result we want. And those things are not there yet. But it is at least a step in the right direction. Just what happens politically around all this, I, you know, that's harder to forecast than the climate is. You know, I think this, this last point here about the time frames, I really wonder whether many political leaders around the world really get this, that we don't have a lot of time. We can't wait till 2050 or 2100 or whatever. It's become much more obvious just in the last decade or so that this is the case. I think what the New Zealand government at least is pledging to do um, is definitely the right thing. If we could get to zero net emissions in New Zealand by the middle of the century, that would be great. Our total emissions on the world scale are tiny, right? I mean, New Zealand doesn't have many people or even that many cows, as it happens. But as an example to the rest of the world, you know, I, I, what I think, what I hope is that there's a sort of symbolic action there that could encourage other countries. If we could show other countries how it's done, that could be worthwhile. But the big players, you know, the Chinas, the US, the Brazilians, are the ones that really have to get on board. And, and the Chinese, you know, they're working really hard. They lead the world in, in solar panels and wind farms, and they're struggling, but they're working hard to get away from all the coal-fired electricity and stuff. So they're, they're trying hard. Just, you know, it is a race against time, whether we will see the emissions reduce quickly enough, I, I really don't know. I suspect that one and a half degrees of warming is, because the time frame for that is so short, I suspect we'll go through that. But one thing that is going on is there's a lot of research on what, what's called negative emissions, clever ways to suck this stuff out of the atmosphere once we've put it in there. It's pretty hard to do. It's a bit like unscrambling an egg. It's going to be a lot harder than, than you know, breaking the egg in the first place. Putting the stuff in the air is much easier than taking it out again. But if techniques can be, if technologies can be developed to do this on an industrial scale, that would that would change everything. You know, it would be a real silver bullet. We'll see. Um, I'll go down the back there. I sort of haven't been. Yeah, yep, yep. I haven't been paying attention to when people put their hands. All right, so I'll try and, try and be brief. So um, the, the question was, why is West Antarctica melting faster than East Antarctica? Um, and could East Antarctica even be gaining mass? Um, so the West Antarctic ice sheet sits largely below sea level, and we know the ocean is the problem. The ocean's warming. As James said, 93% of the heat has gone into the ocean, and a lot of that heat's gone into the Southern Ocean. And where the West Antarctic ice sheet is melting the fastest and thinning the most is where that warm ocean, deep ocean water is getting, that warm water, which is two degrees warmer than the surface, um, is getting up and it's eating away at that ice sheet because it sits below sea level. So some scientists say that the West Antarctic ice sheet is too late. James showed you a figure, it was one of the many graphs we showed, that there is still a chance that if we achieve the Paris target and limit global warming to two degrees, we might save the ice shelves, which would save the West Antarctic ice sheet. Turns out we've underestimated the East Antarctic ice sheet. And a lot of that sits below sea level as well. And that's a sleeping giant that we've only just become aware of in the last few years. There's 20 metres of sea level rise in the ice that's sitting in the ocean. So it will. It's above sea level, but the base of it's below sea level, so it's going to get attacked by warm water, and it already is getting attacked by warm water in some parts. Some climate models suggest that initially, in the next few decades, we could get more snowfall on East Antarctica, and that would offset the melt. That's an area of great debate, but all climate models show that as you get into the second half of the 21st century, you lose mass from both ice sheets. Does that? Yeah. Just quickly, uh, I'd like to hear more about the positive feedbacks. Uh, I, I, my understanding of the end permian is that it's like a double whammy 
And the second part of it was driven by uh, methane flat rate coming out of the shelves. Would you, is, is, are those feedbacks captured in the predictive modeling? Uh, that, that's a good question. The, you're right about the Permian. Um, and a number of times in the past, um, in order to, yeah, I don't want to get into the chemistry too much, but to order, in order to explain um, the size of that carbon event, you have to look at a number of positive feedbacks, whether that's the release of um, methane from the ocean floor sediments or from the permafrost. Um, in terms of future modelling, these are quite tricky non-linear things to deal with particularly the release of um, methane from the, from the melting of the permafrost. Um, my understanding is they're not well captured by models, James. Um, and that's partly because of their unpredictable and non-linear nature. We just don't quite know. I mean, James has talked about methane and how powerful it is. It's a very powerful short-lived greenhouse gas. So the thing about methane is it's all about the, the, what we call the flux, how much over what time period you put in. Now, you could have a burst of methane that might have a small effect on the climate, but then be gone very quickly. But if you have permafrost that is releasing huge amounts of methane over decades and decades, then you've got, got a real issue, and I don't believe that's properly captured in the, in the projections for the future. But it's not happening. And there's no indication it will in the next 70 or 80 years. Yeah. yeah, look, that's, the, that's a very common question, a good question. So the, sorry, the... Okay, so the question is, it's, it's, it's the chicken and the egg question. What drives what? Does, does the CO2 increase before the temperature or does it, lag the, does it lag the temperature? And I had a slide in to explain that, which James made me take it out because he said it was too complicated. And so I'll explain it to you. What we do know is that, you know, I talked about the orbits. So naturally, when we get into one of these warm orbital cycles, um, you know, we start warming the polar regions, we start warming the planet, but not enough to create the huge temperature change we saw between the last ice age and the present day, so we need positive feedbacks. Turns out that we can tell from the, from the CO2 record and the temperature record which comes first. So initially the temperature does go first, and then you see a response in the carbon cycle, so with the, with the carbon dioxide. Now, we don't there's arguments to whether that comes out of the ocean, comes out of the permafrost, exactly where it, where it comes from, and, and I won't go into the details there, but what the records tell us is that once the warming starts, then the CO2 starts to be put into the atmosphere at a much greater rate and volume, and it starts to, to lead the warming, and it leads it by up to a thousand years. So the CO2 gets into the driver's seat and stays in the driver's seat in the natural cycle, amplifying the scale of that climate change, which you simply couldn't get without that CO2 amplifier. Uh, I mean, without going into all the chemistry and the details of the ice core record, is that a good enough answer? We do know that for a fact. In the natural cycles, that the carbon dioxide comes first pretty much drives the big change. Well, the ENSO, the El Nino La Nina cycle, is just something that happens all by itself naturally in the tropical Pacific and has been going on for at least a couple of million years. So, when you have an El Nino event, yes, the whole globe does warm up, and when you have a La Nina event, the whole globe cools down. And over hundreds of years, there is no trend in the number of these events, so it doesn't add to any trend in temperature. And we can see that here, that the upward spikes are the El Nino events, like 2016 was a big El Nino, that's the warmest year on record. But we had one of the biggest El Nino events ever recorded in 1998, that's here. And that got up to about a bit above 0.8 above pre-industrial. This El Nino event a couple of years ago is more than 1.2 above pre-industrial. And the only way there can be that difference is the greenhouse gas effect. So sure, El Ninos make it warmer for a year, but then it cools down again. And to get a trend, you've got to have something else going on, basically. One more question.
So the question, the first question was, what do I think, what do we think about the government's recent decisions around stopping new permits for uh, exploration for oil and gas offshore, but allowing the present permits to continue and allowing new exploration onshore. Um, this might be a contentious thing to say to this audience, I'm not sure, but what was announced, I would say, is a step in the right direction. You know, do this Paris Agreement business, we all know that almost all of the reserves of fossil fuels that we, we already know about cannot be burnt if we're really serious globally about keeping warming below two degrees. So fossil fuels, are, you know, the whole industry is definitely, it has to be a sunset industry. We have to stop doing this stuff. So there's a lot of stranded assets out there, basically. And exploring for more of these fossil fuel reserves just essentially doesn't make sense. It's a waste of money because if we are going to be serious about stopping the warming, we're going to have to stop using these things. So I'm, I'm totally on board with what the government has announced. But, you know, I, I don't know whether you meant this in your question, but I would like to see them go further and to start winding things down here sooner than, you know, the present permits will probably cover the next 30 years or so. We don't really have that time. And again, New Zealand's total use of fossil fuels is tiny on the world stage. But it's, again, it comes back to that symbolic thing. You know, on a per head, on a per capita basis, New Zealand is one of the highest emitters in the world of greenhouse gases. So it's as much our obligation as anybody's to do something. So I, I support what they've announced and I would like to see them go even further. And uh, Tim's going to answer the next part, right? Oh, well, um, you'll have to remind me what, what the second part of the question was, sorry. Oh, 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 so are scientists sort of getting through to politicians? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And I've interacted with parliamentarians for a number of years. What the present, what the new government is saying is much more in line with what I've been telling politicians for a long time. I, I used to write to the former um, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance over the last 10 years or so. And when I wrote to the Minister of Finance, who became the Prime Minister, Bill English, and I talked about the economic implications of climate change and the costs and all this and what a big economic issue it was, the response I always got was, oh, climate change, that's not my, por my, not my portfolio, I'm passing it on to the Minister for Climate Change Issues, wh wh who would then write back and say, yes, sure, but New Zealand's emissions are only a tiny fraction of the globe, so what we do doesn't matter, so thank you very much, but we're not going to do anything. The, the national government did implement an emissions trading scheme, and that's, that is a good thing. It hasn't really been used in anger yet, but it could be, and it's there, and it could be used to greater effect than it has been in the past, so I think that's, that's a very positive thing. Like I said, you know, the present government's only been in power for but over half a year, and they've done a lot of really encouraging talking, but exactly, you know, the, the budget that was announced last week, yeah, a lot of people have complained, everyone's sort of hungry for change, I think, and things didn't really change all that much in that budget. So I'm still waiting to see what actually happens. I would like to see this government and all governments around the world take a much greater action more quickly. How much politicians take account of or get exposure to that sort of scientific evidence, I think it varies wildly from one country to the next. I think New Zealand, we do pretty well. Australia, the same. UK, a lot of European countries. You know, the present government in the US is pretty resistant to these kind of messages, like extremely resistant. What the Russians are doing, I don't know. The Chinese seem to be really on board with this. I went to a a conference over there not long ago and you know for all of the stuff they're putting out all the air pollution and things they are actually trying to do the right thing so I sort of I have some hope there looks like we have to wrap up then Look, Tim and James thank you very much it's uh, absolutely fascinating but incredibly sobering uh, presentation so um, it's uh, yeah we've got to get going don't we there's no much around so look, thank you very much. I think